Wyoming Chamber Board of Directors. And Bruce, may if you want to start uh, heading up here. But um, as those guys are making their way up, I want to do a quick introduction for Senator Allen. Uh, 2014, California State Senator Brad Allen was overwhelmingly elected to represent the 26th Senate District, which consists of the West Side and the coastal South Bay communities of Los Angeles County. Uh, from Pacific Palisades all the way down to the Palos Verdes Peninsula, and from Venice uh, to Hollywood. So, Senator Allen serves as the chair of the Senate Elections and Constitutional Amendments Committee, as well as the Legislature's Joint Committee on the Arts. He is a member of the Senate Budget and Fiscal Review Committee, the Budget Subcommittee on Education, the Natural Resources and Water Committee, the Transportation and Housing Committee, and the Veteran Affairs Committee, which is so appropriate here. Uh, he is Vice Chair of the Select Committee on Defense and Aerospace and serves on the Select Committees on California-Mexico Cooperation, Passenger Rail, Ports and Goods Movement, uh, Refugio Oil Spill, and AB32 and Climate Change Implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Ben Allen. And we're going to do uh, the presentations. Let's uh, go ahead and do that now. So. Yes, and we, we also... Uh, of our friend from Congressman Bass's office as well, who's going to be up here. So nice to see everybody this morning. <clears throat> Everyone feeling good? Good morning. Yeah, Egg sandwiches. So let's. What we're going to do first is call up the the folks who have served for the past year with great distinction on the board, and we're going to present them with certificates, and we're going to bring up the new board, and we'll have everybody up on the stage to celebrate the transition of leadership at the chamber and uh, have an opportunity for photo ops and presentation of these, these ubiquitous certificates that politicians spend all their time giving out. So, so we'll start obviously with the indefatigable Ruzba, who I've been sitting next to the wonderful restaurant there. He's staying at the board. We've also got Steve Little. Steve Little to serve on the board. We've got Elham Yagubian. Norman Verrier. <laughs> 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 I served on the school board in Santa Monica before I taught adjunct faculty actually at UCLA Law School. And that was just really overwhelming. My, I'm actually a Californian because of UCLA. So my father uh, you know, got his doctorate degree from Michigan. And go blue, go blue. And I'm actually dating a Buckeye now, so it's very, uh, uh, real, real, real problems in the, in the neighborhood. But, um, but uh, uh, you know, my mom and dad packed up their cars. I had seen God in the car and came out to UCLA when he got a job offer. And he spent his entire career on the faculty there and had an extraordinary experience. And, and uh, my whole family is very, very wrapped up in the whole Bruin world. So 
I, I had the opportunity to, to, to grow up in Santa Monica and, and, um, and serve locally on the school board before uh, running for the state senate. Now I, it's this really extraordinary honor to, to be able to represent everybody up in Sacramento in this enormous district that covers a million people. So we go all, we actually border Burbank. We, the district includes uh, the Hollywood Bowl, comes right down to the west side and then right down the coast to the Palos Verdes Peninsula and then on to Catalina Island and San Clemente Island, which is a secret Navy base. And the real reason why I, I ran for office was to find out what the hell was going on that island. <laughs> Still haven't um, done that yet, but, uh, but I'll, I'll let you know, maybe, maybe for next year's breakfast. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about, about some of the things that have been happening in Sacramento. Uh, we're actually on what's called summer recess for this month, for the month of July, and then we're going to be going back for the beginning of August. And, you know, it's a chance to have, to have more time to spend in the district. Of course, we've got all the big political conventions coming on later on this month, and the Republican convention will be the third week of July in Cleveland, and the Democratic convention the last week uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, but this is a... Uh, an opportunity for, for me to, 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 to be back and, and just visit with folks. We've been touring uh, various facilities in the district, meeting with, with local local people in, in Los Angeles, and it's a good chance to, to stay tuned with everybody. And, and with that, I, I want to just recognize Fernando Morales, who's back in the back. Uh, Fernando works on our, on our district staff. Um, we have got an office here, uh, and uh, they just work really hard every day taking calls from constituents and hearing concerns from people, and also being able to follow up with everything from you know, people who are having challenges with various state agencies right the way over to folks trying to get their benefits, the people who want to weigh in on the political issues of the day. So uh, we just signed the, uh, the budget, the 16-17 budget. Governor Brown just signed it. And of course, for me, as, uh, having been a school board member who suffered year after year of very, very late budgets, where we were basically being told that we had to present a balanced budget to the county months and months and months before the state would tell us what our what our allocation was, which was very basically most of our budget. Uh, the state, of course, was perennially late, but all of us together made an enormously important change that has restored at least a little bit of sanity in Sacramento. And by dropping the threshold for passing the budget from two thirds down to a majority, and it's interesting because uh, you know, that, that that has just that has added so much more accountability to the system. Interestingly, initially some of the Republicans who were in the minority but have over a third of the legislature were nervous. Now most of them will privately tell you that they're really glad that they made the change. First of all, it means that they can now vote no in good conscience and, and basically say to their constituents, look, I don't, I don't agree with this budget. If you, if you, if you disagree, let vote for us, put us in office. The other thing is the two-thirds actually got, by requiring more people to vote for it, it laid in the budget more with pork because every legislator who really didn't want to vote for the budget would, would force in some new line item that would help their district or some cause that they liked. And actually, it swelled the budget and led to a lot of accounting games that, of course, California became legendary for. I have actually now have some friends who have moved from Washington, D.C. to Sacramento to work on policy because they say it's so much more functional in Sacramento than D.C. Now, I mean, who said, who ever said that with a straight face? And that, that probably says more about Washington, D.C. than about Sacramento, but it actually, I, I will say that there's, there, there is a different mood in, in Sacramento right now. There is, there's more of a consensus. There's more of a spirit of bipartisanship. Uh, there's more of a sense of, of folks getting along to, to try to do what's right by the state. And that's actually, it's been, I'm really grateful to be there in this moment where there is, where there's more, more functionality. Um, one of the other really important things that the governor was able to do recently was create this rainy day fund which we all voted for our, you know, during the last electoral cycle. And I'm, I'm happy about that as well, because it means that there will at least be a certain amount of cushion. I mean, you know, there's always ups and downs to our economy. And as you know, our tax system is very dependent on our high-income earners. And as the market goes down or goes up, uh, it's, you know, the governor said that we had to have a certain amount of of, of, of a little bit more stability to the, to the system. Because it used to be that there would be a crash in the market and all of a sudden everything would get cut to smithereens, including programs that they'd spent all this time building up. And then, of course, all the money would come back and then they'd build it back up again. It just led to a, a really rather inefficient and, and, um, and, and, and very wasteful pattern of spending, ultimately. And I'm hoping that this rainy day fund will help us both prepare for future recessions, but also have a much more sane, uh, kind of more steady spending experience going forward. Now there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, and we 
we've got everything from the Brexit to all of the you know, terrible news of terrorism that have been taking place recently. There's all the madness of the political campaign, and, and this is going to be a wild year. We've got two fascinating candidates and very, very different, very different uh, profiles. And um, but there's a there's a there's a number of things that we're really trying to to, 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 to face as a state right now. We've got an aging workforce with healthcare and pension obligations that are simply going to be difficult to meet. Uh, previous generations have made commitments and promises that uh, were based on expectations and, and, um, and numbers that, weren't necess that, that, that haven't all panned out. We've got a state tax structure that's overly dependent on income tax and capital gains, as I mentioned. It's led to harsh cuts in government spending when our, when our residents can least afford it because it's actually during the times of recession that we end up slashing the most, which is when people are most in pain. And this is one of the reasons why we have to create more stability and more, more sanity uh, to our tour. To our budgetary system. And then, of course, we've got crumbling infrastructure, especially in the transportation sector, even as our state and regional populations continue to grow. Uh, we actually, you know, Algelinos are now spending double the average American in car repair because of how bad our roads are. And if you think about you know, the weather differences between us and the folks on the East Coast, it's even more unacceptable uh, given the fact that they're constantly having snowstorms which beat up their roads. Of course, partly as a result, they're spending a lot, they're, they actually spend a lot more money on maintenance operations which end up costing less on the long term. Uh, and we, we let things go too late, and, and of course we all, all, and all anyone has to do is drive down you know, the right lane on, on Sunset or Wilshire to know um, how, how much we let our infrastructure go. So each of these problems uh, on their own is plenty of reason to keep extra ta cash tucked under the mattress, yet unfortunately a few, even a few billion dollars won't hardly make a dent unless we're also able to muster the, the political courage to make, cho you know, make tougher choices. And, um, you know, I, I think that the, the, the political environment doesn't necessarily make things um, much easier. But we're now in the middle of a comprehensive attempt to try to fix the crumbling infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure of our, of our state. And there's really anybody's guess where this is going to go. The governor's called an extraordinary session focused focus specifically on, on transportation. And um, I was named as one of the five senators to serve on this conference committee that's putting together a funding package to fix state roads, highways, and bridges. And of course, also, we're working really hard to make sure there's an important transit component to that. And um, the idea would be that it would be a $6.5 billion transportation bill that would increase state investment in transit infrastructure operations and, and transportation all over the place. Um, you know, for someone who grew up in Los Angeles and deals with the short rails of traffic every day, uh, it's very clear to me, for, for our uh, ability to grow as a region, we really desperately need to, to build a much more multimodal transportation infrastructure. Uh, the wild thing is that the, our, our housing problem is actually very related to our transportation problem. We've got the worst housing affordability ratio in the country if you look at housing costs to salaries. The housing costs are actually higher in San Francisco and New York, but the salaries are quite a bit higher. Uh, here in the South Plan, we've got similarly high housing costs without commensurate uh, uh, high salaries, at least for an enormous portion of our population. And as a result, people, of course, are having to live further and further and further away from their place of work. And that means, of course, they're congesting our roads all the more. And, and so one of the challenges is how do we, you know, how do we move forward in a, in a, you know, in, in a way that, that, will, that will allow for, for more um, transitor-oriented housing and, and, uh, and you know, build out a transit infrastructure that will actually allow people to get around in different ways than just in their cars. Now, as, as some of you know, L LA County is what's known as a self-help county, and so that it, it chooses to tax itself to help fund its own transportation and transit needs. And um, so, there's a debate right now about putting on the ballot in November a um, a metro tax, and uh, and it's, that conversation is happening in conjunction with Sacramento. And that would require a two-thirds vote, which is no small challenge because it requires a great deal of consensus between elected officials, the chiefs of commerce, and leaders throughout our county that we have collectively yet to achieve. One of the challenges is that everybody wants their piece of the pie, and uh, there's you know everyone wants to make sure that their project is funded, and, and so the the, the metro board is right now really struggling to try to pull together a consensus that can actually win over the support of two-thirds of our population. And ultimately, a two-thirds vote. Is tough because for every one person who wants to vote no, you got to find two people who are going to vote yes. And this is, you know, for a, a it's basically a, t a sales tax extension out into the future. And right now they're proposing it for to, to have no sunset 
which means that you could generate a lot, you could bond against that and generate a lot of money. Uh, but you know, people, of course, are oftentimes very reluctant to to uh, to vote for for new taxes. Um, in this case, it's, it's an extension and a little bit of an increase off into the future. But um, uh, you know, they've been pulling this carefully, and they, I think they're they're trying hard to try to pull together a package that will be able to win over the support of the population and get some more money down the pike so that they can they can speed up the construction of, of these projects. Uh, so it's a it's it's going to be interesting to see how that how that goes. I'm also in the middle of a I'm the chair of the Elections and Constitutional Amendments Committee. We're working really hard right now on trying to to look to, to really look at the way we cast our votes in California. We've got one of the lowest voting turnouts in the nation, and the last round of elections in November of 2014, uh, the statewide average was 42 percent uh, turnout, and LA County was a full 31 percent, 11 points below the statewide average. Partly because we were so far behind the rest of the state in rolling out vote by mail. And we've been trying to learn from other states. If you actually look at the, at the last local series of elections last year in LA County, the local elections were 9% turnout. Really paltry, paltry amount. It really speaks to, uh, to, to, it really raises serious questions about the, the vitality of our democracy and our civil society. And so we're trying to learn from what they've done in Colorado where they have these vote centers. Everybody gets sent a ballot by mail and then there's a vote center that, uh, that, that the people can also go to, or also vote drop boxes. So you can either you can either send your ballot back by mail. You can you can send your, your you know you can you can drop off your ballot in a drop box, or you can go into a vote center that's open for 10 days before election day, and they're all over the state, in fact, all over the county. Anyone can vote anywhere within the county, and eventually anywhere all over the state. Uh, and it just makes it a lot more convenient. There are less there there's less precinct locations on election day. But they've actually found that they've been able to lower costs and increase voter turnout in Colorado significantly. Partly because there's so many glitches and mistakes that are made on election day at those precinct locations. You have to get a lot of volunteers, many of whom don't always know all the rules or know what they're doing. Uh, there's a lot of provisional ballots that are cast through that process that end up also being very, very costly. And, um, and they've just, the folks in Colorado, call up your friends in Colorado if you have any there and, and just see what they think about the system. But we're, we're, we're really trying to, we're, we're looking at their model and trying to see if we can implement it here. And that's been a, a lot of what I've been working on recently. Um, I also am the chair of the Joint Committee on the Arts, which of course is an enormously important issue here uh, in, in Southern California. We're, we, we were able to hold hearings on a whole variety of issues. Most recently we had a hearing on the extent to which school districts are or are not complying with our obligations under the education code as it relates to arts education. And you know, of course it turns out that a lot of school districts cut back really dramatically on arts education during the, the last round of, of, uh, of cuts during the recession. And it's such a shame because if you actually look at the numbers, we find that those kids who are most disconnected from the traditional academic curriculum right. are those who are most likely to respond to an arts curriculum and actually from what, through which the arts curriculum can help to reinvigorate their interest in their academics and in their in their schooling. So a, a strong arts program has understand now that residents are now paying more in tax than business corporations when it comes to property taxes. Right. And what's it going to take to split that to protect Prop 13 for residents, for homeowners, but since since corporate properties don't turn over nearly as frequently as residential properties do, so we have corporate properties that are so undervalued and underassessed and are not paying a fair share. Putting too much of a burden on that. Yeah, so two great questions, and uh, they they both have a similar answer, which is that the, the 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 rules associated with making changes to tax policy in the state legislature are such that you have to have a two-thirds vote of both houses of the legislature to make any change. And in the case of an alteration of Proposition 13, which is part of the state constitution, that would require a statewide vote of, of the population to make a, a constitutional amendment. Um, the entire Prop 13, is, it's, it's called Article 13A of the state constitution. Our state constitution, by the way, is the third largest, cons longest constitution in the world after, I think, huh. India and Alabama. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how those two got higher than us, um, but we're fighting to compete with all these measures. <laughs> um, so the, the short story is, uh, it is the, the on the oil and the oil severance tax. There are just there are too many members who have basically made pledges not to do anything to increase taxes that uh, I think under the current conditions would be, it'd just be really hard to change that. Um, I think there's a lot of people who agree with you. 
myself included, that it's crazy that Alaska and Texas have oil severance taxes and we don't. Um, but you know, but that would require a two-thirds vote of both houses, and I just don't think the votes are there right now. I think similarly with uh, with any change to Prop 13. But you know, certainly there could be a, a statewide uh, signature collection campaign. There was an attempt to do that, I think, with an oil severance tax a couple years ago, and that, of course, was defeated by the by the oil companies because they made the case you know, very aggressively with a lot of money spent on the, on the election that this would increase gas prices. But um, you know. It's, it, there's just a lot of barriers to making those changes. Yeah. And I've talked to you about this in the past, but where are we with uh, people who have used handicap permits? I, in, in, in the village, anywhere between 40 to 50 percent of our spaces are taken up all day by people with fake handicap permits. Where, yeah. Where are we with that? Yeah. So, um, so we're we're working on a bill actually on this, and um, the challenge is is getting it. So the question. So I'm sorry. So in Westwood. Uh, there's a real challenge with people abusing handicap parking permits. And uh, it's just become a big problem. So people who, uh, you know, who, we've got such a parking problem there anyway. And folks who, you know, who really don't need, you know, we want to make sure that those, that those spaces, those handicap parking spaces are there, are available for people who are truly disabled, who really need them, and not people who are abusing the system. And so there are, so the, look, I'll, I'll talk to you offline about this, but there are some, first of all, there's some local solutions that can be, that, that should, need to be, should be done, and we should be talking to, you know, to Paul Peretz and, and, um, and others about, about, some, about some, some, some changes that can be made within the, con, within the, 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 the construct of, of the state law right now that could, could help to alleviate the situation, at least to some extent. And then the issue is gonna be really, um, I tried to push a bill this year, the disability rights community was very concerned and um, raised a ton of concerns and just to the point where it wasn't, we weren't at a place where we could move the bill forward. So the issue is just gonna be um, working closely with them to see if we can strike a, a bargain with them. Um, you know, they have, their, their, their role as they see it is to make sure that they're protecting the rights and responsibilities and, and, and the, the rights of their, of their constituents. And, and um, I think they're just very concerned about about uh, uh, anything that would be seen as impinging upon disability rights. So we're working on it. It's been a tough negotiation, and we're trying to see if we can craft a, a compromise solution that will make a difference for neighborhoods like Venice while also making sure that they're, if we can move them to neutrality on the bill, we can get the bill through. If they're as opposed as they were initially, it's going to be really hard for us to get it out. And so this is this is the this is the negotiating dance right now. And if you have ideas or thoughts you want to weigh in on this, and Steve's talked to us a bit, a bit about this, we want to help because we're very aware. I mean, when I was running for office, it was one of the main things that people in Westwood wanted to talk to me about. Um, we know it's a problem there. And the question is, how do we make sure, especially when we're writing state laws, how do we make sure that we're, you know, that we're, uh, you know, is there a way to solve the local problem, maybe without changing everything statewide? And that that's another. Kind of interesting challenge. So maybe maybe it'll turn into to some sort of policy change at DMV. Maybe a, a, a new uh, interaction with the city of Los Angeles as it relates to the placards. So we're we're having after after, after seeing the way that the, the debate moved during this last legislative session, it's making me think whether there's some more creative local solutions or agency-based solutions. Yeah, Gary. I'm going to welcome to the chamber, and I'm also very glad that uh, you're our senator. Um, one thing I'm concerned about is uh, the social safety net seems to be crumbling with the closure of the YWCA in Santa Monica, with possible uh, threat that OPCC might not be able to renew their lease since they're opening hotels around the corner and people don't want to see homeless folks in the neighborhood. And as these organizations don't necessarily raise as much as they used to and can't necessarily pay the higher rents, on the west side, and even the affordable housing is really not affordable for most folks on the west side. So, what can be done uh, to help the you know working poor and middle class to be able to stay in this community and succeed? Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough question, and the economic kind of factors are, are are certainly playing against a lot of a lot of uh, working folks. So the the good news is that the budget is more generous 
much more generous this year for a lot of social safety net programs than it has been in the past, and so a lot of those critical, you know, we so we we've, we've now ended the ban, the, the maximum family grant uh, limit cap that existed before. I think it was a really important change. So just for people to know, there was a there was a max that, that someone could get, um, and if they had any children above that max, they they, they couldn't get any extra kind of additional welfare support. And the amount of money you get for kids is minuscule. Um, so we, we made an alteration there. We made some changes to allow for more access to healthcare for undocumented children. Um, we've, you know, there's 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 been a number of uh, there's some new, you know, new new child care slots. There's been a dramatic increase in child care accessibility. So some good things that are happening. Um, you know, there's also a lot of work right now to try to get some more money down the pipe for affordable housing and trying to you know try to address our homelessness challenge. We've, we've just passed a bill to repurpose Proposition 63 dollars to, to create $2 billion worth of funds that could be leveraged up potentially to $10 billion for, um, for mental health, for, for, for homeless folks who've got mental health challenges. And so um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's it, there, there's, there, there's a lot happening, but, um, but you know, we've got record levels of disparity in our society. This is a national problem. Uh, we've got tons of poverty in California. People don't realize that our poverty rate is way up there. And if you look at the, at the states, and if you look at certain parts of the Central Valley, it is, it, it's at the levels that, that rival the, the deepest, poorest parts of the South. And, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do it within, within the state budget right now and trying to address some of these poverty challenges. I think there's just, there's limited resources. And, uh, but, but, the, the, you know, the, 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 the Democrats in the legislature and the governor care a lot about this, especially in the legislature. Um, so we'll talk, I mean, your, your friend, we can talk some more about it, but I, I appreciate the question. Yeah. I think we're uh, about to get to one Okay. I see. So Del Bigtree is here, and I'm sure he didn't think I was going to ask him a question. That's I really what I appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. um, so your law is 277 July 1st is went into effect that mandates vaccines for all children, uh, taking away their right to an education for those families that have a, a you know, a different philosophy on vaccinating their kids, whether spreading it out or not vaccinating at all. Uh, given that, I would assume that this law, that the reason you got behind it was because of the theory of herd immunity, that we need herd immunity in order to protect um, our society from disease like measles. Uh, and the unvaccinated population in California children is really 3%, but most of the adults in this room have not been re-vaccinated lately. We know that vaccines wear off. So really, the greater problem is vaccinating adults that we are now... Yeah, two minutes. So that's, what's the question? <laughs> My question is this. My question is this. The pharmaceutical industry is writing laws to make mandatory vaccines for adults. Would you support a law mandating vaccines for all adults in California to stop this? I don't think that's necessary. Uh, I will say so. So just so let me let me talk about this vaccine issue for, for a second. First of all, you know we, we've got the sign about ending polio. My father had polio as a kid, and um, you know for me, uh, people in his generation just can't believe that we have opened the door to the, the re-entry of all these dangerous communicable diseases back in our society. And it's part of why I was involved in this effort to try to tighten up the rules relating to vaccines. Now. I understand there's a lot of, you know, there, there are some folks in our, in our community, and some of you are here today, who are deeply skeptical of vaccines. I did have the opportunity to watch your film. Uh, Mr. Bigtree made a film named Vax. That, um, and what was interesting about it for me was that it ultimately was not an anti-vaccine film from my perspective. What you were really focused on was uh, your sense of increased risk associated with the MMR, uh, particularly when it's given at a certain age to kids. And what I don't seem to understand is why it is that, the, that, 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 that if people want to, s to separate out measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines, why they can't do that. Um, right now, it doesn't appear that that's widely available on the market. I mean, I guess, you know. It's not available at all. You would support a bill to uh, break up the MMR. I, I mean, that, that to me seemed to be the, the obvious solution to the challenge raised by your film. Um, so. You know, that, yeah. But even, even though the greater body of people that are unvaccinated in this country are adults, you don't think it's necessary to vaccinate them? I don't think we're at a stage where that, where, where, where that would be necessary, but you know, 
obviously we're gonna have to see where medical trends go, but I, I that it does that seems to be unnecessary to me. Yeah, last question and we'll finish. Yeah. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, compliment you on your staff. I know you just lost Eugene. Thank yeah, you. Know. And, uh, he was known to many of the Rotarians. He's still alive. He's, he's, dead. Dead. <laughs> he's doing his military <laughs> service in Taiwan right now. He's awesome. Great guy. Yeah. He said he's going in, and he said, I won't be uh, emailing you, Scott, until December. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he was a great asset to your staff. Uh, I wanted to bring to your attention uh, something that maybe is uh, on the, the state level, but I think needs to be addressed on the uh, state level, the solar living facilities. They are unregulated uh, in California, as I understand it. Uh, there's one LA city attorney who's trying to chase down violations. Poor man is totally overwhelmed. Uh, there's no requirement for uh, the numbers. You're supposed to only have a certain number. That's abused all the time. The building department can't get in. There's no official supervision. I wonder if there's anything we can do on the state level uh, to uh, calm this down because a lot of neighborhoods are being inundated. It's not an in the activity. People say, yeah, they can be here, but within certain parameters. Right. So we're actually, I'm involved with a bill right now on this. Um, Richard Bloom is the lead on the Senate side lead. Um, it's run, you know, the, the, the challenge is always going to be from a lot of the folks who are really focused on trying to make sure that we provide compassionate care to people with addiction problems. And so any, it's been really interesting to, to get involved with this because any attempt to try to have some level of sanity, I mean, it's almost like this, the, the, this, you know, the, the, the placard issue, you know, is, is met with this wave of opposition that, that suggests that you know, we're, not, we're being inadequately sensitive to, to the very real addiction challenges that are out there. Uh, so Richard Bloom's got a bill that, is, that, that allows for more local control over, over kind of clamping down on zoning violations. You've got up in Malibu, for example, neighborhoods where the, where the you know, street, the, the whole electricity and water infrastructure is built for homes to have maybe three or four people, five people in the house, and now they're having 25 people in the house because they're people who are in these centers, and it's really straining the infrastructure in all sorts of ways. So, um, so well, we can get you some information about Richard's bill and how it's proceeding. If there's some things, you, you know, take a look at it and let us know how, what you think about it, and if there's things you want to have us add in or try to work on. But it, that's proven to be a real challenge, too. Anyway, really, really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you so much. See the progress that's made on some of these things. All right, just a minute more, and then we're going to dismiss. I, again, I want to thank the Westwood Village Rotary Club. Let's give them a round of applause for being our sponsor today. We really appreciate you. Uh, it has been my pleasure to be your host today. I'm Buzz Park with Lightyear Marketing Group. The bottom line is that if you're not making money from your website, I have a half-day workshop that will show you how to do that. Please give me a call. We're more than happy to talk to you. Um, make sure you go to westlachamber.org or westlachamber.com to find more information about all the opportunities that uh, we have. And Molly is telling me, I think we have the month of September is open for a sponsorship for the breakfast. So uh, I know we had some uh, moving around. So if you are interested in sponsoring a breakfast, this is Give a presentation and distribute information. If you are interested in sponsoring the breakfast for September or another month, please talk to Molly. Molly's standing up with right away.